Well, good afternoon. I'm back home here in Texas. This has been a really hard week for the state of Texas. We've had not one, but two horrific storms. Over four million Texans lost their power, lost heat, lost electricity, lost lights. This has been a frustrating week for Texans across our state. For a state as incredible as ours, the greatest state in the greatest country in the world, the idea that we couldn't heat our homes or, or turn on the lights was, was ridiculous. It was frustrating and it shouldn't have happened. The last 24 hours, it has become a news story and a, and a bit of a Twitter sensation that I went with my family, uh, traveled yesterday to Mexico. Uh, I just got back. I flew out last, l late last night. We had spent two days without power and my girls wanted to take a trip with their friends and frankly get somewhere uh, where it was warmer. And Heidi and I agreed, we took them. I flew them down last night and then I just flew back today. Before then and going forward, I am continuing to work uh, with state officials, with local officials uh, to get the grid back on, to get power back to Texas homes. Uh, at the height, we had over 4 million Amer Americans, over 4 million Texans uh, without power. Uh, the governor's now reported those numbers are down to about 325,000. I'm grateful for all of the people that have gotten power, uh, but that's still 325,000 too many people not to have power. That needs to be fixed, and after that, there needs to be a serious examination as to why it was the grid was not able to handle uh, the impact of this storm, and that's something that I'm going to press for. I know the governor's called for, and I expect leaders across the state of Texas will call for. No, I, I didn't say that. We left yesterday. The plan had been to stay through the weekend with the family. Um, that, that, that was the plan. And, and, you know, I have to admit, it was... The last week's been tough on a lot of folks. Um, we, when our power went out, we were initially, we, we, we had power longer than many. And in fact, a lot of our girls' friends came over. We were hosting them for dinner and they were at our house because we had power and no one else did. And then the power went out right as we were starting to sit down for dinner and was out for two days. Uh, the first night we had a bit of a, uh, what I would say a sleepover where we had kids huddled in, in sleeping bags and, and blankets and wrapped up and, and no lights and no heat. So everyone had flashlights, we had candles going. I, that's an experience Texans all across our state had. Um, we were, by the, by the second day, we were clustered around the fireplace as the only source of, of, of heat. Uh, and, and so huddled up in, in jackets and, and by the fireplace. And, and our girls, when they got the news that school was canceled this week, uh, they said, look, why don't we, t why don't we take a trip? Let's, let's, let's go somewhere where it's not so cold. And, and Heidi and I, this had been a tough week, and this has been a tough year for kids, kids all across the state of Texas. And so we were trying to be good parents and said, okay, uh, we'll do it. And so we, we booked the flight. You know, I have to admit, I started having second thoughts almost the moment I sat down on the plane because on the one hand, all of us who are parents have a responsibility to take care of our kids, take care of our family. That's something Texans have been doing across the state. But I also have a responsibility that I take very seriously of, of fighting for the state of Texas and, and, and frankly, leaving when so many Texans were hurting uh, didn't feel right. And so I, I changed my return flight and, and, and flew back uh, on the first available flight I could take. I couldn't take a morning flight because uh, the current restrictions require a COVID test. So I had to get a COVID test this morning before I could get on a flight back. So I took the first flight I could get after getting the COVID test and, and testing negative. Do you understand why people are so upset right now? And it, it sounds like you, you do have a little bit of remorse from this. Do you, do you feel that it's deserved or not? Oh, sure. Of, of course I understand why people are upset. Um, listen, we're in, in a strange time where, where Twitter's been going crazy and the media's going crazy and there's a lot of 
venom and vitriol that I think is unfortunate, frankly, on both sides. I, th I think e everyone ought to treat each other with respect and, and, and decency and try to understand each other more, particularly in a time of crisis. You know, I, I will say one of the great things about Texas, I, I've served in the Senate eight years. We've seen crisis after crisis after crisis in this state. And over and over again, whenever there is a disaster, whenever there's a crisis, Texans come together. Texans come together and unite. And that's one of the things that, that always makes me proud of this state. When I got, when I arrived and, and saw the initial firestorm, what, what had started with uh, second thoughts that I had at, as soon as we left, uh, grew even greater. And, and I certainly regret that this has become a distraction at a time when so many Texans are hurting and frustrated and mad that this has become an, an item of debate and distraction. I, I, I think that's unfortunate. That was certainly not my intention. Uh, my intention was to take care of my family, which, is, which was the intention of Texans, every Texan across the country and across the state who, who lost heat, lost light. You, you were doing the same thing. You were taking care of your family. And, and um, I think it's unfortunate that that was understood uh, in, in the way that, that, that some of the critics are taking it. Who's the, blame, who's the blame for this disaster in Texas? Who's the blame? Well, look, we had two storms. Uh, that combined, uh, one that hit early in the week and a second that hit midweek. And, and, and it was, that combination is extremely unusual. I spoke this weekend before the storms hit uh, to a meteorologist, a weather expert who was looking at the projections and telling me this, this is really, this looks dangerous. This combination of not just one, but two, the impact on the state is gonna be very serious. That, that, that the impact, is going to knock down power production. It's going to impact the state profoundly. And so I've started, as the, before the storms hit and as they were hitting, trying to warn Texans, take this seriously. This is not just another winter storm. The impact of this is gonna be significant. And, and based on the expert guidance I was getting, I wanted to make sure Texans knew that. I also uh, connected that expert with the governor to make sure the governor had the benefit uh, of this meteorologist's uh, judgment about the storm and the magnitude of what was coming in. And the governor early on, the governor had just declared a disaster in all two, 254 counties in Texas. That was before the storms had hit uh, because the governor was receiving the same advice I was that this combination of two storms was exceptionally dangerous. Um, when the governor declared a disaster, I joined with John Corn and the two of us wrote a letter to President Biden urging the president to declare a federal disaster area for the state of Texas to grant the, the governor's request, and, and President Biden did so. I, I'm grateful that he did. What was not anticipated is that in with this historic cold, and we knew we were going to see temperatures 30, 40 degrees be below historic norms for this time of year, what was not anticipated is that the electrical grid would, would come wildly short of what was needed to, to provide for the needs of the state of Texas. The rolling blackouts that in some parts of the states, I hear reports the, the rolling blackouts were 30 minutes on, 30 minutes off. In other parts of the state, for, for us, it was two straight days of, of, of no power at all. And so it, it seems to have varied geographically region by region. Uh, I think there's gonna have to be a serious inquiry into why it was, what were the factors that led the grid not to be able to meet the, the energy needs of Texans? Um, I've seen some of the early debates back and forth. I've seen some of the reporting that uh, a number of wind turbines froze in, in the low temperature environment. Texas is the number one producer of wind and energy in the country. Uh, about 25% of our electricity comes from wind. And so that was a factor. Uh, there were other electricity sources that also had significant weather related problems, both natural gas and coal. And, and so I think we need to have a, a careful investigation, not in the, the passion of, of the moment when, when people's emotions are, are high, but, but a careful, serious fact-based examination about what factors led to the grid being vulnerable. The, the grid is something that is designed, it is maintained, it is operated, it is regulated at the state level. So that is not, uh, not a federal government operation, but ERCOT uh, has produced real success 
in having low cost energy here in the state of Texas. And most days out of the year, Texans are greater to have lower electricity bills than many other parts of the country. But at the same time, I think a lot of Texans are asking, well, why wasn't it there when we needed it? And we need to have a serious and careful examination of that based on the facts. Should those officials be, should those officials be fired? Well, it, it depends what decisions there ma was made. There needs to be a serious examination of what factors led to the grid not being able to sustain the needs and, and, and failing massively. And, and, and that's something that, that I don't want to I don't want to jump the gun and make assumptions about those uh, those decisions. You know, one of the things we're seeing online is, for example, this being a, a battlefront in in the the wars over alternative energy or fossil fuels and back and forth and both sides blaming the other. Um, look, I think we should be driven by the facts. And, and I don't know. I've seen some of the early reporting. It seems there was a significant number of wind turbines that froze. My understanding is that there are, are wind turbines that are used in other environments that are colder that, that don't freeze. And so uh, these turbines could have been treated in a way to prepare them for the cold weather. That being said, in most parts of Texas, they're in cold weather very often. And, and so that's an examination that needs to, to be made. And an examination needs to be made of, of the other bases, uh, the other sources of energy in the state, and where, where the lack of power generation came from, and what is, uh, what's the best way to respond to that and, and provide to that lack of power generation. Well, what I, what I would say is I was taking care of my family the same way Texans all across the state were taking care of, uh, of my family. And, and it, it certainly was not my intention for that to be understood as, as critics have tried to paint it as, as somehow diminishing uh, the, 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 the suffering and hardship other Texans had experienced. I, look, Texans want this problem solved. I want this problem solved. I want the power on. We've, we've got most of the, the homes that had lost power have gotten power back. That's a good first step. We still have uh, water supply is still questionable in a lot of places, and that's frustrating. Having boil notices, that's frustrating too. We, we need to, the first thing we need to do is correct the immediate problem. And then the second thing we need to do is engage in the longer term examination. As I said, that the, the operation and regulation of that is at, at the state level and not the federal level. But I think those questions, Texans want answers. And, and I'm glad the governor is calling for the legislature to investigate that because I think that that is an investigation that needs to happen. Last question. Sure. Senator Cruz, Senator Cruz, did you, a lot of people are calling your decision to go to King Cruz during this time tone deaf. Did you come back because you felt guilty or did you come back because you got caught and there was a lot of backlash for you going? So, so the question from the video on the cell phone was, was whether the decision uh, to go was tone deaf. Look, it, it was obviously a mistake, and in hindsight, I, I wouldn't have done it. Um, I was trying to be a dad, and, and all of us have made decisions. When you've got two girls who have been cold for two, two days and haven't had heater power, and they're saying, hey, look, we don't have school. Why don't we go? Let's get out of here. I, I think there are a lot of parents that'd be like, all right, let me, if I can do this, great. That's what I wanted to do. Um, as I said, really, from the moment I sat on the plane, I, I, I began really second guessing that decision and saying, look, I, I know why we're doing this, but, but I've also got responsibilities. And, and, and it had been my intention I, to be able to, to work remotely, to be on the phone, to be on internet, to be on Zoom, to be engaged. But I needed to be here, and, and, and that's why I came back. And then as it became a bigger and bigger firestorm, uh, it became all the more compelling uh, that I needed to come back because our priority should be fixing this problem and making sure it doesn't happen again. And, and I didn't want all the screaming and yelling uh, about this trip to distract even one moment from the real issues that I think Texans care about, which is, which is keeping all of our families safe. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.